Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 12th. I'm going to try um, during the warm weather time when people are out and doing more things to keep it to three main stories and keep the TDD reports um, a little bit short. Definitely try to keep it under 10 minutes. This first one is from TechDirt. It's called That Time a Star Trek Captain and a Physicist Got Tricked into Doing a Documentary on Geocentrism. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there's a movie coming out, I believe, in not too long, maybe in less than a month or two, called The Principle, and it's a geocentrism movie. It's about the author um, thinks that the Earth is the center of not just the solar system or the galaxy, but the universe, and uh, Kate Mulgrew did the narration of that movie, and it was kind of interesting because she got all kinds of questions since she did the narration, and she was the, the person doing the voice for the movie, if she actually believed in that or not, and she did post on her... Uh, website that she was, I think on her website and on Twitter, she also let people know that she was not uh, a believer in it. She was just the voice for it. And uh, she also said if she would have known more about it, she probably would not have taken the job. Um, so she did at least admit that responsibility. There was also a physicist, Lawrence Krauss. And you'll also, if you watch the trailer, you'll even see Michio Kaku is in it. I think in the case of those two guys, because they signed releases to uh, production companies that used a lot of their clips in various different specials, um, they probably signed some kind of release that if you have enough money you could probably use it in almost any kind of a documentary if you claim it has something to do with science. So um, Lawrence Krauss, just like uh, Kate Mulgrew, said that he had nothing to do with it himself. It was just they used some clips of his. And the kind of neat thing about it is neither Kate Mulgrew or Lawrence Krauss, and as far as I know Michio Kaku or anybody else, is deciding to sue the guy about it. Um, it doesn't look like he did anything actually to violate anybody's rights or copyright, and it is kind of your responsibility when you do sign releases to stuff like that to know what it's and to ask what it's going to be used for, and if you don't like it, put that in the contract yourself. And I'm sure Kate in the future probably for um, voice narration in the future is going to have very specific things in the contract about she has to know what it is about. But I'd just like to ask you guys out of curiosity, if you were asked to narrate a science special, but then you ended up um, finding out it's maybe a science special about Bigfoot or UFOs or let's say just pick some subject you don't believe in. Maybe it was a uh, do narration for a ghost hunter special and you don't particularly believe in ghosts. Would you still be willing to do the narration to it? And what would it take for you to finally say, no, I won't, even if you're going to pay me hundreds of thousands or even a million dollars, that I'm just not going to narrate a special like this. So it's an interesting kind of question. I would say for myself, Probably if it was something innocuous like Bigfoot, which I just don't believe in, but it's not going to really, that I know of, do anybody any kind of harm. Probably if somebody offered enough money, I would probably narrate it. I, I don't myself tend to assume if I watch a TV special on UFOs, Bigfoot, or even on a science special that's uh, legitimate science, I don't tend to all the, automatically believe the narrator totally believes in what's being presented. I realize he's just a paid person doing the voice, so that's my kind of take on that, but I would like to know your take on it. This next one is, and I'm not, I don't think the title is exactly accurate, it says IRS tastes its own medicine and will pay Microsoft millions for Windows XP support. I talked about this with some friends on Facebook before about the UK is paying uh, Microsoft $9 million for additional support of Windows XP for at least till the end of next year. And uh, yeah, they're saying, yeah, the IRS gets a taste of its own medicine, but the IRS doesn't pay for it, we pay for it as the taxpayers. So. Um, yeah, same thing uh, in the case of our IRS, just like the UK government. I guess over half of the computers for the IRS are still on Windows XP. And the only thing you have to have is you have to have money and you have to have a plan that sometime by the end of the year you're planning on. You don't have to actually do it, but you have to submit a plan that you're going to upgrade to uh, the next Windows operating system, which would be Windows 7. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, yeah. Looks like uh, quite a few millions are going to be spent for that. Uh, my argument, like I was talking about and people that were talking about it on Facebook, was if um, Microsoft's um, obviously going to be past the, I think it was the 8th, yeah, I think it was April 8th was the cutoff. If they're still going to have the same guys working on producing the patches and stuff like that, why not make it available to individual users? They're saying 25 and maybe even 20% by the end of the year of computers are still going to be using XP on the Internet. Well, if those things get up, end up getting infected and, and have security vulnerabilities, everybody's going to pay for it. So uh, why not make it available since they're already going to be made anyway? Why not make some kind of patch kit available to individuals, at least for the next year running, if you're going to make them anyway? I mean, why not sell them at a reasonable price? Maybe um, tell people for a 
a $25 quarterly subscription or maybe even $25 for the year that you will uh, uh, give them basically uh, not maybe every patch to everything, but at least basic security patches. Uh, that's just kind of my take on it. And last up, this one I've actually seen on a couple of different websites, just two. Um, this is a, I actually translated it one from a Portuguese website, and then let me get the other one up here. Here it is. This is from medium.com, how an ordinary camera phone can photograph objects hidden behind other things. And this is really interesting. They say there's no need even for a lens to be able to detect objects behind some type of a frosted or semi-transparent glass or any kind of translucent object. Um, it started out with the idea of single pixel photography, and I won't even really get into that. You can read the article for that. But basically what they do in this is they take a Nokia Lumina phone and then they put a little pinhole in front of it because they say the lens isn't really that good to start with and they don't really need the lens. All they have to do is direct a pixel from the um, that goes past the, the reflects off the object, goes past the translucent object and actually hits onto a sensor and then the rest is just basically computer processing. I'll put the picture up here to show you. Um, they could take objects like, uh, I guess it's something like a silhouette of the letter X and you get what the uh, scattered light is and then by using computer power and crunching the pixels you can actually see that it's the letter X and then there's various other a smiley face and okay and you know just letters and stuff letters and shapes basically it's not going to the way they have it right now you're not going to take um, detailed high resolution pictures of anything but um, they also use this little trick of reconstructing off of bounced pixels on a, on a wall so in other words you could see around a corner a reflected image that was on the other side of the wall actually they were able to detect what it was so uh, I think between this technique and thermal imaging where I've seen pictures of where you can take uh, the right kind of cameras and see people walking around in a room and detect that it's people basically their size and shape and stuff like that um, this thing can really be used in, in law enforcement and stuff like that they're talking about since they took pictures through the skin of a chicken I think it was and uh, used that so you don't need if you're thinking that you need some kind of a translucent um, piece of glass that's in perfect optical order or something like that, evidently you don't because if you can take a picture scattered through a, an onion skin and chicken breast tissue they, they use and still get a, a useful image of what's going on behind there. So they're talking about using that for medical work. I'm thinking too in law enforcement too if you could, um, if you can't step in front of a door opening but you can at least catch the reflected light from door opening if you have the right kind of a, a setup to examine that light maybe you could detect most of the basic objects and the people in the room and see what's going on. Um, so, yeah, in the future, don't think just because you got a translucent frosted glass um, on the side of your house that people can't tell what's going on inside your house. Evidently, if this uh, gets better and better, they might be able to detect some uh, pretty decent resolution of objects. So, anyway, that's the three main stories for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.